Hello friends, Bujurina Junya Darug Nurawa. Good to see you on Darug Country. Welcome to 11 stories from the River Jurubbins audio walk at Street and Lookout, Freeman's Reach. Naya Giara Rhiannon. My name's Rhiannon. Naya Darug Buraburongal Nurugu. I belong to the Buraburongal Grey Kangaroo Clan of the Darug people. Bayaju Gulbanga Gnurigang Yura Guragao Yagu Barabugu Daragura. I pay my respects to elders, past, present, and emerging. Yanawiju Manuiwa Muru Borangad. Walk with me in the footsteps of our ancestors. Naraji Dabuwamili Jurabangu Waraja Muru Badu. Listen to the story of our Jurubban and the lagoons, creeks and waterways that feed her. This river is our ancestor, a living, breathing being, sung into existence from creation. In Darug Delung, our language, we have names of places along the river that speak of her body, like Narung Barai, Little Leg, and Gruagung, Kneecap, Goodbye, Arm, Nuna, Elbow, Maramara, Fingers, Nabung, Breast, Dargle, Jawbone, Garganyang, Big Mouth, and Milang, Eyes. The river holds our dreaming, creation stories, and song lines connecting us across countries and nations. Jurubin carries a shared creation story of Gurungaj, the great eel. Remember Midiga, tread softly on this dreaming. We were strong here. We remain strong here. We will always be strong here. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander listeners are advised that this audio walk contains stories of historical violence and Aboriginal people now resting in the dreaming. Listen and enjoy the stories, but please do not reproduce them in any way. Thank you. Guiyanma, come to the cliff edge. From this high rock terrace, we have a great view across Durubbin's vast floodplain and the Cumberland Plain beyond. Looking up river to our right is Yarramundi, and the V-shape in the rocks that you can see there is part of the gorge the Gross River has cut through to join Jurubbin. Upstream of Yarramundi, let your eyes follow the river, tracing its path along the foot of the escarpment back towards Penrith, where Europeans gave the river a different name, the Nepean. Looking in the distance, you might see another distinctively rounded gorge in the rock face, where the Nepean River has cut through the rocks just beyond Penrith. And perhaps you can even see beyond that, to where the Warragamba River joins the Nepean, bringing with it the waters of the Coxes, Wallandilly and Natai River catchments, with a massive amount of that held by Warragamba Dam in Lake Burragarang, supplying much of Sydney's drinking water. Jurubbin's mighty catchment extends some 470 kilometres almost to Goulburn and covers over 22,000 square kilometres of Gundungara Wiradjuri, Darawal, Darig, Darkanyung and Goringai countries. Looking out here over the country Jurubbin has shaped, the stories of deep time are in the landscape all around us. My name's Tom Hubble. I'm an engineering geologist that works on lakes, rivers and out in the deep ocean. The precursor of the present day Hawkesbury was up there. Somewhere between three and six kilometres above us, there was rock. Over the last 120, 140, maybe 160 million years, that rock has been gradually weathered away and eroded out and transported out into the Tasman Sea. So the Hawkesbury Valley that we all recognise and love, where we are now, which is pretty open country, and then we get the sandstone gorges up around Warragamba and through Camden and down south, 
towards Menangle, those valleys were cut by a river that cut all the way down through those rocks. And the actions of those rivers and the fullness of time has removed all of the rock that was adjacent to the river channels, even quite some distance, kilometres and kilometres away, east and west or north and south from where the channel is presently. With all of that winding, meandering stream channel that the present day river occupies, that maintains the geometry, the shape, the plan form, we call it, of the original river that was way up there, three, five, six kilometres in the sky above us. Nalawa, let's sit here for a while. Grace Carskins, Emeritus Professor of History at the University of New South Wales and author of People of the River. I always think of three things, mountains, terraces and river. And of those three, the river is by far the oldest. It's Gondwan and it's an ancient river. So it was flowing well before the 90 million years ago that Australia started to crack off from Gondwana and start its very, very slow drift northwards. And so sometime after 90 million years, the Blue Mountains start to rise. It's so slow over, over millennia that the rivers can keep up with it. And all the various rivers start cutting gorges through the mountains as they're rising. So that's why we've got so many deep gorges. So the Nepean cuts through the Nepean Gorge, Cox's River cuts through, You've got the Hawkesbury cutting through at this end, and you've got the Colo cutting through, and the Gross. So as the mountains go up, <laughs> the rivers are also cutting them down. Millions of years of cutting down and stone rising and wearing out. It's just unfathomable lengths of time, really. And meanwhile, what the river's doing is it's washing all this soil down from, from the mountains and building terraces. It's a very busy river. So it builds these flat terraces along its banks through flooding. When a river meanders, it cuts in one side and lays a terrace on the other. Flats are the low terraces and there's high terraces too. It's been doing this for millions of years. And of course, the most recent ones are only 10,000 years old. So that's where the beautiful river flats are, where the yams grew and where the settlers planted their corn and wheat. And the other thing that's happened with the river that's really important is it's got narrower it's now getting quite old. So it once flowed right across where those river flats are now. It took me ages to realise that when you're on a river flat, you're actually in the river bed. Because what happens in flood is the river just gets bigger and takes back its older channel. This bit here is only its modern old self, but when it gets lots of rain, it fills up and it goes back to its old self, which is the old terraces. So you mean it used to be bigger? Much bigger. Huge, and it ran much faster. Quite a scary river, full of spray and brought down huge boulders. The dynamic story of Jurubbin's formation, of water cutting down rock, of the uplifting of mountains and the river having been so much bigger, faster and wider in the deep past is reflected in the creation story of Gurungaj, the great eel, Jurubbin's rainbow serpent, recorded in the rock engravings along Jurubbin, on Nura, country, our temples, our sacred places. Buruburongal educators, artists and writers, Leanne Watson, Erin Wilkins and Jasmine Seymour. I've always known the Gurungach Merrigan story from where they rested at Bent's Basin. I was always told that it was a Gundangara story. The whole story is about the friction between them and that friction is what's caused the movement of the earth and the creation. Gurungach was explained to me as a rainbow serpent, so a serpent type being. And the rainbow serpent is the creator of the waterways on Dairy Country. But in reading a lot of the engraving sites and the stories in there, I think it's actually a giant shape-forming eel. It's a continuation of a story that happens down the south coast and it continues through Wollombian Caves, Janolan, 
comes back through Bant Space and then crosses over into Durry. Gorongach travels along the riverline. Merrigan, who's like a giant quoll, uh, fighting through all these other countries as it comes back into the Durry country. As Merrigan is catching him, it's when the river narrows and when our environment is in drought. When Gorongach is succeeding and he's getting away from him, it's when the river widens to give him that huge space to speed and is when we have the rain. Not just the river, but the environment is all connected to that creation. We know the Gandangara story of Gorongach where he's chased through the Blue Mountains by Mirigan. And that story ends abruptly, I feel, in Lake Borogarang because it's a song line. Where does it go then? That's where all the rivers start to go into the Hawkesbury. Aboriginal stories, they're not just in one place, they're connected all over. I think with colonisation, the Dari lost quite a bit of their cultural stories. My grandmother's mother and father would have known the stories and my grandmother probably did know the stories as well, but they wouldn't pass them on to the children because at that time we still had the black cars trying to take the children and so the stories weren't passed on in that generation. In recent years, it's been discussed with the Gunnagara how the story connects to the Darig and that the Gurungatcha's offspring is our creation and the creation of the Hawkesbury River. We've actually seen quite a lot of the engravings in the area that hold the stories. And it is the eel-like figure, which to me is Gurungatcha's offspring. When we get to the Hawkesbury around Cadai, you start having these enormous eel engravings of Gurungaddy, which is what we call him. We know from the language we have found corresponding to place, that they believed at certain places along the river. One particular place called Durambulua is the path of the rainbow. And in that spot, the rainbows sort of reflect in the sky and they look like a giant eel line. And they're just incredible. And we know how important rainbows are for Aboriginal people, you know, those signs in the sky and how intimidating and how incredible that would have been to see that on the river and how important eels were to the diet as well it's the most abundant food there other than the perch and the mullet there's certain places where you have the engravings of the figure on either side of the river and a very very deep hole they normally have giant eels in there and they're at a turning point in the river and that's where the story says that he rested our stories, and I've known for a long time now, they're still here. They're in the landscape. It's just spending the time looking and piecing things back together. So you have the big long journeys, of course, the song lines, but then you have your section of song line and what that means to the people of that place. And so for us, along the Hawkesbury River, the Jurabin, we know that there are multiple sites of enormous eel engravings and words that mean eyes and legs and arms and throat and mouth. And so this river becomes this huge living entity that has created country. And many of the engravings are also maps of the river. They look like to us. When we look at them, we think, well, that's that. It's very obvious when you look right yeah, at it. Corresponds to this yeah, river. exactly. It's the same shape. How can it be anything else? Yeah. <laughs> if we look over the lowlands of the floodplain in front of us, we can see the fertile river flats, now a patchwork of green paddocks, on which grazing, turf farms, horse studs, and fruit and vegetable farms thrive. Before colonists cleared them for farming, these river flats were covered in dugga dugga, river flat forest, and a necklace of long thin warajar, lagoons, like Pew's Lagoon and Mara Mara 
to the right near the town of Richmond. Lagoons are part of the river, places the river used to run, and were rich places for our people, brimming with food and resources like magura, fish, mussels, birds and plants such as baraba, bulrushes, which had edible roots and strong fibres which were used to make string. Waraja lagoons were important gathering places. Darug people called the floodplain area Marang Nura, sand camp. On these low river terraces, our people sustainably cultivated midyin, yams, a staple part of our traditional diet. Looking down the river and over to the left, you might see the silver reflection of Baker's Lagoon, the largest Waraja lagoon on this part of the floodplain. To the right of Baker's Lagoon is the air control tower of Richmond's Air Force Base. Beyond Baker's Lagoon, the floodplain rises to our hill camp, Volga Narang, now known as Windsor. Let's head downriver to our left, along the grass, towards Volga Narang. Ahead of us, beyond these properties in the suburb of Freeman's Reach, was a significant quarry and toolmaking site for our people. Darug educator Erin Wilkins. Up at Freeman's Reach, Hawkesbury High School, there's a massive quarry site, quite significant for silcrete basalt, more so silcrete. Silcrete was a rock that we used for a lot of our tools and our weapon making. Silcrete was also a widely sought after resource from neighbouring nations, so that would become quite a big trading resource across nations. Trading was everything, so we would trade a lot of the fish, sometimes neighbouring clans not so much, but more so neighbouring nations. So bartering system was massive. It was a way of gaining resources that weren't available in your areas. So a lot of the wood here is great, but the preferred density wood is not found down here, it's found on the other side of the mountains. So that would be one sort of trade link. British exploratory trips up the river in 1789 and 1791 recorded much of the landscape and resources our people collected around Waraja lagoons and on the floodplain. Well, the first exploratory trip along the river in 1789, they would have come up from Broken Bay. As they come up the river, they start to see river flats. The lowlands were all churned up and they knew it was yams. It was women digging for yams. And as we now know, the yams were the staple food of the Darug people on the river. And this played out historically later as well, of course. What they also found were lots of traps by the lagoons. There were holes dug and just lightly covered over with grass and shrubs. They think to trap animals. And then there were really fancy eel traps and bird traps, very beautifully made and disguised with feathers. And so very sophisticated methods for catching food, basically. And the food was just abundant. Not only yams, but the lagoons on the river are just chock full of waterfowl ducks, swans, everything. Lizards, frogs, so it's like a paradise. In 1794, just downstream of Windsor at our Geralba, Corroboree place, a group of ex-convicts pulled ashore and started clearing the Dugga Dugga River Flat Forest to make their farms. In 1794, things start to take a turn for what we would have to call an invasion. From an Aboriginal point of view, you can't describe it any other way. A band of about 20 people spread themselves along that reach and start putting in wheat and corn. It soon became pretty obvious that you didn't have to work as hard on a farm on the river as you did in some of the other areas. And more and more people, 400 within a few months. Can you imagine the impact on the local landscapes, the paths that you're using, your ceremonial sites, everything would have been more and more disrupted. It's not only the taking of land, it's also because they broke all kinds of moral laws. They stole women and raped them. They stole Aboriginal children, mostly babies and toddlers. And that's the worst grief ever. And I think it's been underestimated in historical accounts. Darug and Darkin young people along the river fought back, but the government sent out soldiers 
as the fertile river flats made for rich crop yields in wheat and maize, which the colony soon came to rely on as its main food source. In 1794 and 1795, the first recorded massacre of Aboriginal people by settlers and the first recorded massacre of Aboriginal people by the military in modern Australian history took place on this floodplain that lies before you. The river is like the lifeblood of Aboriginal people. So the impact was severe for the settlers coming in onto the river. Movement and travel, trade, diet, resource, everything was impacted by the point of a settler coming in and placing these fence lines. They couldn't get to the staple diet of the yams or to any other food supply that was along them. There was a lot of resistance that ended in, I think it's fair to say, warfare. There were some settlers that were really, really good and allowed them onto the property, whether to be passing through trying to continue their traditional lifestyle. But that dislocation, that displacement, it was a demise to the point of traditional life as we know it. They survived, they're resilient people, they survived, but traditional lifestyle ceased to be what they had known it to be. Further downstream on this side of the river, the banks begin to descend down towards the river flats around Wangi, Wilberforce. Once you've made it to the fence at the end of the park, we'll turn back up river to the other end of the park. For most ex-convicts, being granted land, owning property, would have been beyond their wildest dreams back home in England. Can you imagine today being gifted a riverfront acreage? But not many people think about the fact that this land was taken from our people by force. For soldiers and officers of the military, land grants became a means to trade and build wealth. Land along the river here near Baker's Lagoon on the stretch of the river that became known as Freeman's Reach was granted not to ex-convicts, but to officers and soldiers in the military. Local historian and author of Porksbury Settlement revealed Jan Barclay Jack. The British government had decided that ex-convicts whom they wanted to farm here so they didn't go back to Britain, they were encouraging them to stay and farm, they were entitled to 30 acres. Anybody who was married got another 20 acres for their wife and you got 10 acres extra for the children. So as soon as the first crop of wheat came in and the yields were 30 bushels to an acre, which was not parallel. The officers were very upset that they had let the ex-convict settlement be on this land and they set about trying to get some of the land for themselves. The grants were hierarchically staged from 100 acres for the officers down to 25 acres for a common soldier. And they were given in the reach beyond most of the settlers around the Central Reach, mostly in Freeman's Reach. A whole lot of soldiers requested the 25 acres and the officers bought them. They bought them up in a big way. They would buy 14, somebody like John Palmer, the commissariat, and in that way would consolidate a large property for themselves. Groups of them, Collins for instance, purchased what he called Willow Farm, which was four lots of 25 acres, so he got himself his 100 acres there. William Baker, the storekeeper, had purchased four allotments from soldiers and had 100 acres down near Baker's Lagoon. And by September 1795, the officers had ownership of the entire reach and there were something like only six soldiers left farming in the Hawkesbury by 1802. Perhaps one of the only waterways in the area named after a woman is Cooley Creek, which ran through Sarah Cooley's property, Argyle Farm. Cooley Creek connects Baker's Lagoon to Jerubbin. Sarah Cooley was a convict who in 1793 became the mistress of Commandant Neil McKellar. She was one of only a handful of women to receive a land grant in her own right, as well as running Argyle Farm a 160-acre consolidated soldier grant on the river and Baker's Lagoon, which McKellar purchased in 1796, 
Mackellar as commandant was absolutely the top peg at the settlement, which meant Sarah Cooley became the most important woman in that settlement. And she was trusted absolutely by Mackellar. She was a businesswoman and a trader in her own right, so that she was giving mortgages in her name to people and then gaining the property when they couldn't repay, giving loans to others. She was a force to be reckoned with. It's a great lookout, this place, which became a public reserve in the 1950s, after the Corriedale pig stud was subdivided. It was initially named Lions Club Park and Terrace Park, and later renamed Street and Lookout, after one of Australia's most well-known landscape painters, Arthur Streeton. Streeton painted one of his most famous landscapes, Purple Noon's Transparent Might, from a spot very near here on a hot January day in 1896. A green signpost that depicts the painting is along our path today. Head for it now if you haven't already reached it. Streeton's friend and fellow Heidelberg school artist, Frederick McCubbin, later wrote that the painting was a poem of light and heat, and that you could almost take this picture as a national symbol it is on permanent display in the National Gallery of Victoria. What you can't see in Streeton's painting is any sign of my people. The riverbanks and floodplain denuded by grazing cattle, our yam beds, ceremonial grounds and meeting places invisible. In the 1890s, after nearly 100 years of colonisation, the Aboriginal Protection Board were underway with their policy of segregation and established a reserve for our people along a very steep, narrow bank downriver at Sackville. The board was also removing children of mixed descent from their families to be merged into the non-Indigenous population, bringing more terror and trauma into our people's lives. Local artist Greg Hansel helped establish the Hawkesbury Artists Trail and have this reserve named after Arthur Streeton. We had Terence Lane who was director of Australian Art from the Melbourne Art Gallery, and Oliver Streeton up here, who was Arthur's grandson. And we took these guys down to the actual site. It's a couple of kilometres up the road, opposite Wire Lane. It was pretty close to the exact spot. I thought they'd be hard to please, but they were looking at the calendar photograph, looking up, going, oh, wow. <laughs> and it just knocked their little socks off. All the Melbourne sites have been built over. Heidelberg and all those areas have just been developed. But here you can look at the spot and you see straight up the river. I've got two pages here and it's a letter Oliver Street and gave to us. It's the whole letter that he wrote about when he first painted Purple Moon's Transparent Light. Attired in my old clothes and battered hat, I hoisted myself upon a borrowed horse. My canvas, four feet square, hung on my back. My pallet, billy of water, paint bag and my lunch were tied and slung about the bodies of the horse and myself. And so I rode to my painting ground on the terrace, three miles distant, and arrived in a very dusty condition. The glory of the river and plain spread before me in a temperature of over 100 degrees and still rising. The view being partly obscured by two saplings, I was compelled to place my canvas on the edge of the precipitous cliff, and arranging the heavy end of a dead sapling upon the edge of the canvas, I avoided the trouble of carrying an easel. Far below were the tops of river oaks and water like the blue of a black opal. The brightness of the noon, the power of the deep blue, the flies, and the temperature now 108 degrees, wrought me to a pitch of excitement. My black boots drew the heat, so I took them off. I whistled, sang aloud, and cursed the flies. Having no charcoal, I designed my picture in cobalt and light red. My back was smarting under the sun, so I replaced the shirt which had been put on a bush to dry. The temperature, 10 degrees higher than my own temperature, crept around my face like a flame, and it seemed like working in a fiery trance. I paused and found that in two hours, two thirds of my canvas were covered with paint. 
I had stamped my big impression upon it. I had made my big picture. My theory is you want the great outdoors but didn't want to go too far from Sydney. He was a city kid. This is about as far as he got from Sydney here in Glenbrook for fires on. Streeton just didn't travel too far and this is his great Australian landscape. It's a beautiful spot because it's a very steep cliff a couple hundred foot or so down to the river and then it's floodplain out, the Cumberland Plain out from that. And you've got little glimpses of the mountains behind. There's the old college pump down here that looks like a lighthouse. I've done a couple from here. It's a big oil, it's about five foot I suppose and it's in Susan Templeman's office. The old pump house Greg was telling us about that you can see in the painting is below us on the floodplain. The still standing remains of the old Hawkesbury Agricultural College pumping station, which supplied water to the college's river farm in the town of Richmond from 1909 for several decades. Just over the river from here, River Farm has been part of Hawkesbury Agricultural College since the late 1800s and is now part of Western Sydney University. Let's head slowly west along this path now to our right. Further this way, up the river about one kilometre beyond the North Richmond Bridge is the water intake for Sydney Water's off-river water supply. This pumps water from the river and treats it to supply water to the towns of the area, including Richmond, Windsor, Pitt Town, Londonderry, Wilberforce, and here at Freeman's Reach. Up here in this park, you can see a few metre boxes on poles and outside the toilet block. They're for properties up here on the terrace that have licences with the New South Wales Office of Water to pump from the river for irrigation. The farms on the floodplain below us pump either from the river or from the lagoons. Along the Hawkesbury and Lower Nepean River catchment, there are over 1,500 water licences which in 2020 to 21 pumped over 13,000 megalitres of water from the river. My name is Basant Maheshwari. I work at Western Sydney University. I'm a professor working in the area of water, environment and sustainability. The river is very close to my work and my heart because the river is a live entity. It's not just a physical thing. It's the vegetation, it's the life in the river. Many people depend on the river. The river is a very valuable asset for the whole of Sydney. There's certain flow required to maintain the aquatic life in the river. But when you start extracting that water, then it changes what aquatic life can survive and they come to an equilibrium. And I think the biggest change was the Waragamava Dam. The natural flows, high flows, low flows, they have been minimized. So there is a big storage on one side and then control release into the river. Every day about 20 megalitres. Looking at the population we expect say by 2030, we may just have enough water for drinking but not for other things like irrigating parks and ovals, irrigation of the crop and so on. So we really need to reuse some of the waste water we have and also manage storm water properly. In an ideal situation, there is a base flow. Means when river is running low, groundwater will contribute. So if there is still no rainfall, if there is a good groundwater situation, the groundwater will contribute to the river and there will be a flow. And that's a good thing, especially during droughts. And then when we have good rains, then some of the river water will go into the groundwater system. But if we have lowered the groundwater levels of the area through irrigation, through more pumping, not enough recharge, then the contribution of groundwater to river may not be enough. If you want to manage the river and the whole water cycle in the area, we cannot ignore groundwater because it's, it's the total water which is important. The demand on the river's catchment for water is growing constantly. Dr Ian Wright, Senior Lecturer in Water Science, Management and Environmental Planning at Western Sydney University. Oh, this river is an absolute environmental treasure of southeastern Australia, Sydney. It's absolutely loved, but there is 
no coordinated management whatsoever to look after the values that people love. It's an absolute disaster of management in my mind. So the majority of the headwaters are dammed. There's a few that aren't, that's pretty rare. So the Colo and McDonald and some of the network of streams that come off that aren't. And that's why the Colo is actually protected as a wild river. But then if you go up the Hawkesbury to the Nepean, it is highly regulated. And that means we've got large lumps of concrete or stone or earth impoundments that Sydney uses for its water supply. The Avon, the Cataract, the Cordo, Nepean, Winch Caribbean Reservoir and of course the giant Warragamba Dam gather water behind them. We siphon that off to feed Sydney's absolutely massive thirst, 1,500 megalitres a day. That is, it's like an Olympic swimming pool every five minutes of water. And that is flow that's held behind these impoundments, these dams, that then denies natural flow further down the river. So the flow that we see, say, from Penrith, Windsor, Richmond, Wiseman's Ferry, we only now get a shadow of its former flow. There are environmental flow releases from a lot of those dams, and they attempt to keep the river ticking over, but it is not natural. It's not the natural flow regime. There's an argument as well that in very dry times, the river, and this is where history and social history is so important, I think in places the river flow declined to an absolute trickle. Streeton's paintings of the river, both Purple Noon's transparent might here at Freeman's Reach and Summer Noon at North Richmond, show a lot more sand in the river. In the 1990s, historian Sue Rosen wrote, Losing Ground, an environmental history of the Hawkesbury Nepean catchment, following a study she prepared for the then Sydney Water Board. The Europeans didn't recognise that the country that they were rowing through or sailing through or walking across and it was in fact the product of systematic land management. And they looked at that land and so often the terms of how it could be improved. And, and improvement meant that they go in and use it for European stock grazing and of course the destruction that that brought. The first thing they did when they went out to the Hawkesbury is cutting down trees on the banks of the river so they could bring their boats in and pretty soon after you're seeing then paintings and images of slumped banks and all that's adding to the sedimentation in the river system. I mean we think we're progressing when in actual fact we're degrading the place. One of the most momentous discoveries was that Windsor was an ocean going port early on where ships were equipped and set up for expeditions of four or five months out into the Pacific. But then after the railway went in across the Blue Mountains, and if you look at the zigzag and Lithgow, and there's Conrad Martin's paintings in the 1830s and 1840s of these just great slopes of rubble. Because you had not only the clearing to put the railway through, you had all the camps of the navvies who were building it, who were cutting down everything to build little huts and then using it for firewood. And that washed down into the Cox's River and then through the system. And by the 1880s, 1890s, you could almost walk across the Hawkesbury at Windsor. It had sedimented up, so I guess they lost the ground in the mountains and there it all ends up at Windsor. Cutting through rock over millennia, the river is always moving sand, and here on the floodplain, it gets deposited. Our people's name for the Richmond lowlands is Marung Nura, meaning sand camp or place of sands. Sand has been dredged out of Jarubbin since the late 1800s between Yarramundi and Pitt Town, used in the construction of Warragamba Dam as well as Sydney's building industry. In 2001, a geological survey by the New South Wales Department of Mineral Resources looked to ensure ongoing supply of sand after closure of the Penrith Lakes scheme in 2010. The survey identified 229 million tonnes of sand on the Richmond lowlands for possible extraction. However, extraction of sand remains constrained by existing zoning laws, the value of prime agricultural land, conservation values of wetlands, and the impact on the river system. 
In 2021, development approval was given by Hawkesbury City Council for sand mining on River's Edge properties in Freeman's Reach, on this side of the river. This will remove 700,000 tonnes of sand over 10 years. We've extracted so much sand and gravel out of the river, and that was a really important part of its physical makeup. In high flow events, the eroded sediment, it's actually a really important part of the stream environment. We've changed it forever. So there are areas that are now deep that used to be much shallower. So they had shoals. They've been removed. Thousands and thousands and thousands of tonnes removed. We've kept going. We don't take anything like as much out of the river now, but we take it out of the floodplain, and that's Penrith Lakes. And all of that changes the river. We change the flow, we change the sediment, we've changed land uses, and we've discharged waste into it. And surprise, surprise, the river's as good as it is. By now you've probably walked the entire stretch of this small park, so feel free to walk back and make yourself comfortable wherever you like. This lookout is a great spot to come and watch the river when it's in flood, and it reclaims the whole floodplain, its old course. In flood, the lowlands before us become like a massive lake, even in the most common one in five chance per year flood. These lowlands are the most flood affected in the whole Hawkesbury Nepean Valley. In the one in 100 chance per year flood, flood waters would extend for 20 kilometers. In the 1867 flood, the largest on record, we would be looking over a vast inland sea, stretching all the way to Riverston. One observer of the 1867 flood described it like this. Places which, since settlement of the colony, have never known to be flooded are now lost to view. The plain on which Windsor is partly situated unites with South Creek and Eastern Creek to form a vast inland sea, over the surface of which, when the wind has been high, broken crested billows roll with as much force and volume as they do during moderately squally weather in Sydney Harbour. A boat may now be taken through deep water from Riverston to the Blue Mountains, a distance of 15 miles, and from Halls at Pittown to the Courageong, some 20 miles. Sydney Morning Herald, 24th of June, 1867. The Hawkesbury Nepean has the longest written flood history record in Australia and this has contributed to our understanding of floods and cyclical climate regimes. Even the span of a human lifetime is not really long enough to witness the full range of cyclic rainfall, cyclic river flow and the life cycle of a lot of the trees. A colleague of mine, Robin Warner, a professor of geography, a rivers expert in the early 1970s, working with reasonably good rainfall records that went back to the 1880s, roughly. He was able to establish an idea that the river flow patterns seemed to be really quite cyclic, and Rob called it a drought-dominated regime, where most of the floods that did happen would be relatively small, maintained within the riverbanks, and fairly infrequent, so a smaller number of smaller floods would occur and that was related to decades or so of, of fairly dry conditions. So, like the Federation drought, right through until the end of the Second World War and a bit beyond, there was a big drought that affected New South Wales during the war. And then in 1950, everything seemed to change. We got much larger rainstorms, lots more of them, and we started to get some of these big flows. Right through the 50s, there were a large number of much larger floods. That period of flooding went on for about 40 years, from about 1949 right through until the early 90s, and then it went back to being dry again. We haven't really had any big floods until the last couple of years, and it's 1990 that the last one of similar size came through, and that fit exactly with the model that Rob had proposed, that over a period of somewhere between 80 and 100 years we'd experience about half the time in dry weather and about half the time in wet weather. And that is similar to the El Nino-La Nina cycle which is anywhere between three and seven years where we go 
in El Nino we get really dry conditions and then we'll have a La Nina event and we'll get lots of flooding. To have a 40 or 50 year period of relatively dry conditions followed by relatively wet conditions needs some other large scale atmospheric climatic driver and possible culprits for that and it's becoming pretty well recognised. There's the Indian Ocean Dipole and the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. There's also another major current that feeds into that which is the Circumantarctic Current and so it's the synchronisation of these different oceanic circulations that are probably driving these long periods of dry weather and long periods of really wet weather. In December 1803, the Sydney Gazette reported the death of Bench, a respected elder of Jerubbin. Local settlers recounted Aboriginal stories of Bench possessing supernatural powers, stirring up wind and fire and commanding floods and rains. He was clearly a Karadji, a clever man. A Karadji is a spiritual healer and keeper of culture, with a strong understanding of sacred places, ceremony, country and law, and a deep connection to the dreaming. I wonder if Bench could have foreseen what was going to unfold on our country. Since 2017, the New South Wales Government and Water New South Wales have been investigating a strategy to raise Warragamba Dam Wall by 14 metres. The proposal has been surrounded by controversy with a parliamentary inquiry investigating the integrity of the environmental assessment process, a scientist resigning and the New South Wales Premier declaring the project as critical infrastructure, which would save more than 8,000 people from flood risk in the next 20 years, but also allow development of thousands more homes across the floodplain. The raising of the dam wall, I'm skeptical about it. Just looking at the case of the Wyvernho Dam in Brisbane, and it has a flood mitigation capacity. At the moment, Warragamba and the other dams do not have flood mitigation. They're there to supply domestic water. But flood mitigation means that you've got an area above the full water storage. In a flood, it can fill. They slowly release that to moderate the flood peaks. I think we need to look very carefully at Wyvernho Dam. It is uncertain what benefit that dam and the flood mitigation has provided the Brisbane River. At one point they have to open the floodgates and it even seems possible that that may have worsened some of the flood peaks up there. So here I have those concerns. I do know the dam and its catchment quite well. I worked as a catchment officer for a couple of years and I've been to a lot of those areas that would flood along the Cox's River, the Natai River, the Wollondilly, the Kaumang. And I am concerned that the environmental impacts of even a temporary impoundment in flood mitigation will be considerable. I know it will flood areas of archaeological importance to Aboriginal communities. It was and is a very rich area. Now there is a belief that the flood mitigation and raising the dam will be good for people. There is also a concern that it's really good for real estate development and zoning and building construction on parts of the landscape that are known to flood. So based on all of that, I remain very concerned about it and I'd like to see vastly improved flood evacuation and preparation down here on the floodplain before I believe that raising the dam, I know it's going to have a lot of costs, but I'm dubious, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that it's worthwhile. Arthur Parks was a dairy, vegetable and turf farmer living on the Richmond lowlands near Baker's Lagoon from 1934 and was interviewed by historian Sue Rosen in the early 90s. Well, when we first came here in 1934, you could drink the water anywhere at all, even Baker's Lagoon. I wouldn't have any hesitation in pulling up along any of those creeks and getting a billy full of water out to drink. When we first came here, it was all dairy. Everything in the horsery was dairy. But we used to milk about 20 by hand and still make a living. All the work was done with horses, no sacrifice, in 1934. But none of the farmers had much. They lived practically off the land. And we were dairy for quite a while after the war. They didn't have many cows. I think there were 117 suppliers of the horsery factory. 
When it closed, I think there was about three left, but they were bigger. They were bigger. There's about seven, eight hundred cows now. I started growing vegetables and finally and gave the dairy away. If the vegetables weren't much good, you couldn't get any money for them. The thing that knocked the vegetables mostly in the district here was the interstate transport. Then this turf, then this cow. There's still a few market gardens going, but very few. You'd think turf would be taking away a lot of dirt, wouldn't you? And by the time you come to cut it at all, all you're really cutting off is the fowl and you're in the cuttings. The floods came in 1949. 38 floods in seven years. 38 times they'd come up and go down. There's one farm in Farm Wallace. Uh, when the white man came here first and took it up, it was 40 odd acres. There's only two acres left on this side of the river now. All the rest on the other side of the river. And farms had changed a lot, particularly. The river cuts in, the bends. It's cut one farm right away there. The river's still no wider than ever was. Terrace over here. Terrace is pretty well pure shale now. A lot of those houses on the terrace will get a very big shock one day because there's quite a few caves underneath the water and go under the terrace. A couple of acres will fall in there one day. Bagers, like yeah. that. they used to have the swans nest there every year, they used to, mm -hmm. they don't nest there now. And the pelicans would be there in droves, they're not there anymore. Back in the 60s, there's, there'd be 17 or 18 swans nest there with all the young ones and everything. I think it's when the sewage started to speed up a bit. The birds have nearly stopped there. I think it's the lack of the fish. I think it's the sewage, whether it's hunting the fish yet, but there's still a big carp in there. I had a couple of chaps come here a couple of weeks ago. And they said, could they fish bakers like them for eels? And I said, what are you doing with eels? Oh, he said, we sent two tons a week to Japan. I said, no, the Japanese are pretty good uh, coming out of bakers like that. And they said, oh, yes, they love them. I said, and they send them over live. They had to catch them and they've got traps in the river. They've got traps everywhere in the whole spring. They go by boat, but there's plenty of eels there. You can go there with a spear and spear the eels because they're thick. Richmond Air Force Base was established in 1925, the first in New South Wales. And since the 1960s, the base has been discharging its wastewater into Baker's Lagoon. In recent years, the lagoon and the farmers of the Richmond lowlands have had to contend with contamination from PFAS, firefighting foam used on the base and released through its wastewater into the lagoon and across the lowlands. Dr. Jason Reynolds from the School of Science, Western Sydney University. In the case of Richmond and in the case of Williamstown and Newcastle and Oakey in Queensland and up in Catherine and Northern Territory, they all coincide with the presence of an Air Force base. And the issue has always been on the use of firefighting foams, which contains these PFAS compounds as like a surficant, as a material that generates bubbles that can choke out oxygen around a fire. And when we look at a place like Richmond, the contamination source is coming from the wastewater treatment plant as they discharge their water onto the floodplain. Uh, in this case, it goes down into the lagoon system. So the properties on either side of that channel that drains into the lagoon are heavily contaminated with PFAS. And it has little to do with the firefighting foam and it has a lot more to do with the way that we use and regulate wastewater treatment plants, both directly into the Hawkesbury and Pan and onto the land use itself. There are already reports released by the RAF base through their consultancy, the AECOM, uh, that have told everyone that there are PFAS all through the lowlands of Richmond and have advised them not to eat too much of anything that comes out of that area and to be very careful if you have chickens in your backyard not to handle contaminated soil in the Richmond lowlands area. And that's causing concern for farmers on the lowlands. There's a leasehold for some cattle on there and that farmer's particularly concerned. There's some moderate to low level agricultural productivity, pecan farmers, vegetable farmers. They're all growing on PFAS contaminated soil. And so this becomes an issue from a human health perspective. We're trying to follow whether it's making its way all the way to the Hawkesbury or is it getting stuck in the lowlands in the lagoon system. Western Sydney University is researching PFAS, looking at ways that we can remediate the land and looking at ways that we can clean it up. Because at the moment, there is no easy way to repair the land. If it was contaminated soil, as it is on the RAF base directly at Richmond, they simply scrape it up and put it into a furnace and burn it at 1200 degrees, they ash it. Obviously that takes time, that takes energy and some significant cost. We are looking at ways that we can remove these compounds in a more safe and easier fashion, such as growing certain types of grass or trees or crops that might rapidly soak up the PFAS and then we can harvest that and then that's much easier to handle. Yeah. 
Sue Martin is an environmental educator, heads Cat Eye Hills Environment Network and is part of the Hawkesbury Nepean Waterkeepers Alliance. She used to work for the Hawkesbury Nepean Catchment Management Trust, a New South Wales government regulatory authority that looked after the whole of the Hawkesbury Nepean catchment from 1993 till it was axed overnight in 2001. We as community have lost our connection to place. Every bit is important. It's actually knowing where your waterway is and where it goes. There is no public water quality data that tells you the story of the Hawkesbury Nepean. People assume it's there. People assume that there is this agency looking after the river but there's none. They all got abolished. I think the Hawkesbury Nepean suffers from having 24 councils as opposed to the Georges that has seven and the Parramatta that has six. And so much is happening in the Parramatta and the Georges and the Cooks River. The Cooks River Alliance, you know, amazing. Hawkesbury Nepean is missing. And I think the issues of sand mining and dam wall, it's too political. The Hawkesbury Nepean Waterkeepers Alliance is various organisations that have come together that really want a community voice for the river and encouraging the Hawkesbury Nepean to go down the line of having legal rights of a river enshrined in law, similar to the Yarra Act that has First Nations enshrined in caring for place. But it is the First Nations story for us to listen to about our river. Darry custodian Jasmine Seymour wrote the song that you are listening to. Nyara nyara badu badu, nalawa nyara nyara badoyin nurawa. Translates as, listen to the river, to the water, listen and learn from water on country. Nyara nyara badu. In the context of rainbow serpents, they're great, massive, sacred highways, rivers. How can they not be? This is the path where it went through and the rivers nurture, the creeks nurture. And in the Hawkesbury, we have all these homeless people living along the river. The river is still looking after people. Even in the state that it is, it is a haven always for animals and life. And even though all the retardant from the RAF seeps into it and all the fertiliser from the turf farms, we don't look after the river, the South Creek and Wianga Matta and the Jurabba and the way that it has been treated by industry. It is still a place of great beauty and I would love to see the entire Hawkesbury get behind a huge Aboriginal festival, whether it's a lantern parade where you create these enormous eel like things and you parade it and you celebrate the river what a beautiful thing since 1870 maori people of the whanganui river in new zealand fought to have their river recognized i am the river and the river is me new zealand's maori like our people see the river as a living being and not something that can be owned In 2017, the Whanganui River became the first waterway in the world to gain legal rights of personhood with an Act of Parliament. In Australia, Melbourne's Yarra River was also recognised as a living entity by the 2017 Yarra River Protection Act, the first legislation in Australia to be co-titled in a traditional owner language. Willop Jin Birurung Moron translates as Keep the Birurung Alive in Woiwurrung the language of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people. Dr Michelle Maloney is a lawyer and the convener and co-founder of the Australian Earth Laws Alliance, 
She recently spoke at a Hawkesbury Nepean Waterkeepers Alliance forum about the emergence of earth laws around the world. Earth laws might have a part to play in recognising and protecting Jurubin within the Western legal system as a living being. Think about earth laws as an emerging umbrella concept that's got lots of different bits and pieces under it, all of which are trying to take the worst of industrial society and turn it into something better. Earth jurisprudence is a theory that says all of human societies should use the beauty and wonder and guidance of nature to construct your own governance systems. Human beings should live within these great laws of nature. And this is actually an echo of what Indigenous communities already know and have always done. But when you're looking out at the world with Western law glasses on, the living world is nothing more than property. Our legal system says some things are worth protecting, voila, there's a protected area or a national park. Some animals are worth protecting, voila, this is an endangered species, it's a platypus, but hey, over here there's another animal, literally another evolutionary companion, but legally that's mine. I own those cattle and I can eat it, but I can't do that to a platypus. All of this stuff is just human constructs of what is valuable and what is legal rights of nature laws exist in Ecuador, Bolivia, Colombia, Mexico, US, Europe, New Zealand, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Uganda. In Ecuador, all of nature has the right to, and I might not have the exact words, exist, thrive, continue its vital cycles, live without interruption by human activities, and often a right to restoration. Any person across Ecuador can theoretically stand in a court of law and speak on behalf of a bit of nature. They've had something like 30 cases held on behalf of nature. So it's actually going very well. There are different ways that different peoples have recognised rivers in law. If you have a whole jurisdiction that recognises the rights of nature, then theoretically all the rivers have a right to exist and thrive too. And in fact, the first court case in the world on behalf of an ecosystem was the Vaikabamba River in Ecuador. In New Zealand, the New Zealand government passed into law that the Whanganui River is an indivisible and living whole. It's a legal person and has all the rights, powers, duties and liabilities of a legal person. Then there's the examples like Colombia and others where they simply say this river has rights in law. So they're not constraining it with legal personhood. And then you've got examples like the Yarra River Act or the Birrarung Act, which recognises the Yarra River as an entire entity, a living being. It hasn't changed the legal status. And the Birrarung Council has no veto rights. It has no control rights over what happens to the Yarra. But I've heard that it's changed many people's perspectives of the river rather than thinking they can just do whatever they want or paying no attention to the Yarra at all inside Melbourne City, knowing it's a living entity and thinking about how do you do design within a rights of nature framework so it's already having some pretty important cultural change. The Marawara Fitzroy River Council is 12 or 13 different Indigenous groups and they've made a declaration that the river is an ancestral being has a right to life. It's a great example of of Indigenous people leading, pushing back at the system, saying to everyone, this place is remarkable. It's got its ecological and scientific value, but it is first and foremost a cultural landscape. Thanks for your company. Didjerugura. We hope you've enjoyed 11 stories from the River Jurubbins Street and Lookout audio walk. For more information, please see the Hawkesbury Regional Museum website. There are 10 other audio walks along Jurubbin you might like to do. Nabawunya. See you soon. Remember, Midiga, friends, tread softly on this dreaming. This country is alive with the Gumara, spirit of our Wurungad. Ancestors, we were strong here. We remain strong here. We will always be strong here.